Good morning to everyone who is joining us from the Latin American continent and good afternoon uh, to all those that are joining us from uh, our European continent. My name is Victoria and I am one of the two regional coordinators for EURAXIS here in Latin America and the Caribbean and together with my colleague Charlotte who is based in Brazil and myself in Colombia uh, we make uh, the team uh, for your access Latin America. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce a webinar called ERC Funded Research on the Amazon, where we are going to welcome three researchers who are going to talk uh, and share a little bit about their research exactly on this specific topic. But before I give them the floor, I would like to very shortly introduce um, the ERC and to give you a very short introduction to uh, what, what kind of uh, research it funds and what kind of um, calls we have available within the European Research Council. So the European Research Council as a funding agency belongs uh, under the Horizon Europe, which is uh, the ninth framework program of the European Union for research science and innovation. It's um, the framework program, which is the biggest uh, we've ever had uh, within the EU uh, with the budget of almost 100 billion euros. The European Research Council grants uh, can be found under the first out of three pillars of Horizon Europe, under the first pillar called Excellent Science, as you can see on the slide. The budget uh, of uh, the European Research Council uh, constitutes about 17% of the overall budget of Horizon Europe with 16 billion euros for the period of seven years, which is the duration of the framework program Horizon Europe from 2021 to 2027. So what are these type of grants? The ERC funds individual excellent researchers um, that uh, write uh, basically projects that have uh, a long-term impact, that are high risk but high gain, um, that are disruptive, um, that uh, are frontier. Uh, therefore, uh, we are looking for researchers from anywhere in the world uh, who would like to uh, go for these type of grants. ERC funds researchers from any nationality and any research field. Um, as you can see on the slide, we have a lot of different evaluation panel, to be exact, 27, uh, that are divided in three domains. Um, we have evaluation panels within life sciences, physical sciences and engineering, and also social sciences and humanities. Um, the basic grants uh, of the ERC uh, are, as you can see on the um, on the slide, uh, we have the star starting grants that are for researchers that have between two to seven years of experience after the PhD. We have consolidator grants that are for researchers that have between seven and 12 years after their PhD advanced grants for uh, leaders, for researchers uh, that are uh, more experienced, where we will be looking at the last 10 years of their research uh, uh, tra trajectory. Um, and then we have the synergy grants, uh, which are a little bit different uh, compared to the first three, because this is the only type of grant uh, where we can have more than one principal investigator. We can have between two to four principal investigators. And one of these PIs can stay um, completely outside of Europe, based in a non-European country. Therefore, you that are based in Latin America and the Caribbean, you can be completely based uh, in one of these Latin American countries and take part in a synergy grant with European colleagues uh, to form uh, this small group of uh, principal investigators, as we mentioned, between two to four. So these are very uh, attractive grants. As you can see, the budget is between 1.5 million euros to 10 million euros uh, when it comes to synergy grants. Uh, for the first three, uh, we are looking into grants that have a duration of five years or up to five years, and the synergy grants have a duration uh, for up to six years. Um, so here we have uh, the opportunities that uh, the ERC offers for you. When it comes to today's uh, webinar, uh, we are going to have three short presentations uh, by three researchers, as I mentioned at the beginning. We are going to start uh, with the first presentation by uh, our principal investigator, Dr. Patricia Vieira, 
uh, who has currently a consolidator grant, which is called ERC Echo Project, which is obviously just an abbreviation. And she, uh, she will tell us, of course, much more. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victoria. It's a great pleasure to be here today in this um, uh, event about ERC funded research uh, on the Amazon and to share some, uh, some of my work with, with colleagues and with people in, in various continents. Uh, um, I will uh, start by introducing myself uh, and talking a little bit about the project. Um, I am um, the PI of the project ECHO, Animals and Plants in Cultural Productions about the Amazon River Basin. I will share the project's website with you uh, so that you can see how it looks uh, now. Uh, I am a literature and film studies scholar. Um, I started and I did all my career in the US. I, my PhD is from an American university. And I was a full professor in the US up until recently. And I decided to move back to Europe um, to work on this project. And because I, uh, through this project, I also managed to secure a permanent position at the University of Coimbra. Uh, the ECHO project started in January 2022. So uh, we've been going, uh, we've been going on for a little more than a year and a half. Uh, we just turned in the first report uh, to the to the ERC, and um, what I'll do now is I'll I'll present a short video uh, that that describes the project and its goals. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we we are doing in the project in the past eighteen months, and I'll also show some of the first outcomes of the project so that you can have a feel for what it is that we are doing um, in the project. And so uh, I'll start with the video. Uh, this video, I, I did it in the beginning of this year. Uh, it's not a completely professional video, but and it's not an academic video as well. Um, what I wanted to do was to um, manage to convey what the project is about uh, to someone who doesn't really know much about my area of, of literature and, and cultural productions, and to offer an introduction to, to what we're doing in ECHO. Uh, and to uh, show why it is important to do this kind of work in the current um, in the current social and, and political environment in the Amazon. So let's go ahead and watch the video and and then I'll explain it a bit more. My name is Patricia Vieira and I would like to introduce you to my new research project on animals and plants in cultural productions about the Amazon River Basin, or ECHO. The project is funded by the European Research Council and it is developed by an interdisciplinary team of anthropologists, historians, literature and film study scholars over a five-year period between 2022 and 2027 at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra in Portugal. The Amazon River Basin spans nine South American countries and it's known, is known for its immense biodiversity and for being the home of numerous indigenous and other traditional communities. It houses over 10% of the world's known species and its peoples speak over 300 different languages. The ECHO project examines the multifaceted ties binding plants, animals and humans in this complex but fascinating territory. How do animals and plants impact Amazonian literature, cinema and the arts? What can Amazonian indigenous communities teach us about a balanced relationship between non-humans and human beings? In which ways can Amazonian thought contribute to ongoing debates about the Anthropocene, climate change, environmental degradation, and anthropogenic species extinction? These are some of the questions I address in ECHO. The guiding premise of this research is that Amazonian cultural productions highlight the ways in which non-human beings shape human cultural life. These cultural productions also allow animals and plants to express themselves, thus decentering humanity as the sole source of meaning-making. 
What if we thought about literature, mythology, folk tales, film, sculpture, painting and so on as the co-creation of humans and non-humans? In which ways would our legal, political and ethical understanding of animals and plants change if we consider them to be able to express themselves through human art? ECHO develops the concept of zoophytography that is to say, the discourse of animals and plants within human cultural life. So photography designates an encounter between the animals and the plants' inscription in the world and the traces left by that imprint uh, in texts, cinema and artworks. It results from the communion between the animals and the plants' mode of articulation and the human language of artistic expression. In lending a voice to animals and plants, Zoophytography also redresses the epistemic violence of silencing Amazonian indigenous communities and traditional communities and their systems of belief. It does so by drawing on their cosmologies, which rely heavily on a view of non-humans as beings that determine human lives. The Amazon, its human and non-human communities are facing unprecedented challenges. Human-induced forest fires and illegal logging are leading to rampant deforestation, which is taking the rainforest to a tipping point beyond which it will undergo an irreversible process of savanization. Agriculture, mining and other industrial interests are polluting the river's waters and clash with the local population's rights to continue living in their ancestral lands. At this time of rampant environmental destruction in the Amazon, ECHO examines the role of animals and plants not as passive objects of representation, but as active participants in the creation of texts, films and artworks. Through the analysis of these works, the project reveals the interconnections between non-human forms of expression and human cultural life. It also draws attention to the pressing need to imagine equitable ways of inhabiting the planet together with all other forms of existence. This was a, a brief introduction to what we are trying to do in, in the project. And uh, what I would like to do now is to talk a little bit more about the kind of work that we do more concretely. So here you had an overview. And then I'll give you a few examples of things that we have been working on. And so um, the work of ECHO is done by an interdisciplinary team. I already mentioned that I am a literature and, and film studies scholar. I work with two anthropologists um, who are uh, postdocs in, in the project, another postdoc who is a historian, and a PhD uh, student who is also a historian and an environmental activist. And you can see more about the team in, in, the, in the website that I'm showing. Uh, beyond this core research team, ECHO also has a scientific advisory board that includes anthropologists, an archaeologist, a law scholar, a historian, and another literature scholar. And we also have in the project a variety of affiliated uh, scholars uh, and, and other researchers uh, that include artists, uh, poets, philosophers, art critics, and so on. And I am emphasizing this um, transdisciplinarity because uh, it also reflects on the kind of work that we are doing that seeks to bring together theoretical insights uh, from the environmental humanities uh, and from anthropology to analyze uh, cultural productions about the Amazon that focus on, on animals and plants. For example, our work includes uh, theoretical reflections based upon existing texts on environmental philosophy, but also based upon indigenous thoughts, upon uh, post-colonial um, post studies and so on. We do archival uh, research in libraries, museums and so on, mainly the historians and myself, and also uh, the anthropologists also do field work with, with indigenous communities. And this is one of the novelties of the project, uh, uh, really to look at, way, at ways in which non-humans are 
active partners in human cultural life in the Amazon from this variety of, of perspectives. <clears throat> perspectives, sorry. And this diversity in approach is also reflected on the kinds of activities um, that we've organized in the project. Uh, if in, on our website we have a list of activities, uh, uh, now in October we'll have activities and, and events that relate more to literature, we'll have a book launch, uh, in February of next year we'll have an event on monocultures, uh, if we scroll further down this summer we had an event on Amazonian futurisms more than human imaginaries that took place in, in Peru, we have a lecture series, and we've had, for instance, um, I'm scrolling further down, uh, uh, an Echo Images Film Festival showing indigenous cinema here in Portugal. And so there is a variety of events really that reflects this, this variety of approaches. And um, since I, I think I don't have that much time anymore, I would just like to go through uh, a couple of the outcomes of the project to show you uh, uh, more concretely, what is coming out of, of these collaborations between different disciplines on this topic. Um, and I'll, I'll look specifically at three outcomes. One of them is a traditional academic out, uh, outcome. Let's say it's an edited book, co-edited book. In this case, it's a co-edited book on contemporary indigenous Bra Brazilian thoughts and ecology. And uh, the book uh, is uh, co-edited by myself, uh, Karen Shiratori, who is one of the uh, postdocs in the project, and uh, three other professors, one uh, from the United States and two from Brazil. And it will be divided into six topics, indigenous ecofeminism, reforestation of indigenous, indigenous lands, ecologies and more than human beings, rewilding of urban areas, resistance against logging and mining, and isolated indigenous peoples. Uh, what is new about this, this um, co-edited book is that first it will be the first book in English to offer an overview of contemporary indigenous Brazilian thought. And then I think the methodology is also quite novel because as probably many of you know, uh, not all indigenous people um, write essays, not all of them uh, even speak Portuguese, let alone English, and though, and so we had to devise, and we are doing it as as uh, in, we are in the process of doing this, of creating ways of um, gathering this information on indigenous thought that will have to be adapted to each particular person and situation. In some cases, um, some of these indigenous leaders will write essays; others we'll have to work with them through conversations, interviews, sometimes involving translators, anthropologists, and so on, to uh, be able to have access to, uh, to the wealth of, of, of indigenous thought in Brazil, which can contribute to, to ongoing debates really about, um, uh, about uh, environmental issues that are, are so pressing today. And so this is one of, of it will be one of the outcomes of of the project, this uh, this co-edited book. Another outcome that is quite different, so I, I tried to bring three different um, outcomes that would speak to different audiences. So a second outcome that is also in the making um, <clears throat> is a short film uh, uh, on oil palm monoculture in the Peruvian Amazon. And this short film came out of an um, artistic residency that the two anthropologists in the project organized, uh, Emmanuel Fabiano and Karen Ciratori. And in this uh, artistic residency, um, uh, they worked with the Shipibo indigenous community um, uh, and a group of artists from that community called Comando Matico and Brazilian artist Denilson Baniwa, as well as a few other scholars. Uh, and within this process of, of, of exchange and dialogue, uh, they decided to make a short film on the destruction of the Amazon to plant oil palm monoculture in the Pucallpa region in there in, in Peru, where the where the Shipibo community is based. And so this film uh, and, and this, this in exchange is a collaboration between Peruvian and Brazilian artists and scholars, as I said, which is something that unfortunately doesn't happen often enough. Uh, often Amazonian countries uh, don't dialogue 
as much as they should. And so we wanted to foster this kind of dialogue also between not only between politicians, but between artists and people working on the Amazon. And I brought to you today um, a, a, a short soundtrack that will be part of, of this of this film. Uh, this is a clip uh, uh, of rap that was made by a Shipibo a musician during this artistic residency. Uh, it's sung in Shipibo and in Spanish. Uh, the first part is in Shipibo and the second part is in Spanish. Uh, as I said, this is a musician by, uh, that belongs to Comando Matico, uh, this, this Shipibo artist group. And in Spanish, basically, uh, well, I, I'm sure everyone um, uh, speaks Spanish, but what it says is the forest is not for sale, the forest should be defended and so on. So it's, it's really a short rap music against this uh, exploitation of the rainforest to plant um, uh, oil palm. Uh, so I would ask Charlotte to just play uh, the the video, uh, please. Uh -huh. yeah. Comandomatico, we can, 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 we La selva no se vende, la selva se defiende, la selva no se vende, la selva se defiende. Cushi no y cawan, no con cai bobo, cushi no y cawan, no con cai bobo. Comando Matico, en defensa de todas las comunidades nativas de la región Cayali y el medio ambiente. You probably got the gist of it. So it's the Comando Matico, it says in the end in defense of native communities of the Ukayali region and of the environment, right? So this will part, be part of this film that is currently being edited and we uh, we are trying to launch it during the monocultures event in February because it is about uh, monoculture as in, in the Amazon. And I know I'm probably running out of time, so I'll just very, very briefly present uh, one last outcome of the project, which is... Um, uh, an online exhibition of indigenous Amazonian art focusing on animals and plants. And um, it's titled Politics and Poetics of the Rainforest, Indigenous Ontologies in Contemporary Amazonian Arts. And so this is basically, um, we wanted to bring together again, artists from different areas of the Amazon. Up until now, we only got Peru, Colombia and Brazil, but the idea is that we will be working on this um, exhibition to enlarge it and to add uh, uh, other artists. We launched this in uh, the event we had in, in Peru, in, in, in Lima in July, and we will continue working on it. Uh, so you have it here. You can then look look it up with uh, with more leisure yourselves. Basically, it's divided into these three topics: existences, memories, and resistances. And so when you click, it will just take you uh, to a gallery uh, uh, with artworks on each of these three topics. Here we are in existences. Uh, then we can go to memories. It jumped to Spanish. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and then there is also, uh, so these are the artworks and here you can click on more, you can open um, each artwork and have a more detailed view. And, um, and then there is the part about um, resistances as well, right, I'm, I'll just go with the Spanish one to be quicker. Uh, and there's also um, a list of the artists we have thus far uh, in the exhibition. As I said, we want to continue working uh, to, to add more artists. And then once we click on each artist, uh, one can also see all the artworks by that specific artist. And if we click on the artwork, we'll have a detail of, of this artwork. And then we can move back and forth and see the next ones. So, uh, 
This was just um, to give you some idea of the concrete outcomes of the project. Of course, there are many other things in the making. I, I didn't really have time to go through it all. And um, I was very happy to share some of this with you and I'll be happy to answer questions in the end. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Patricia, for sharing, um, even if just a little bit of the project, but uh, uh, I believe that it, it truly has uh, a huge impact because if uh, wherever we are in the world, everyone knows the Amazon, right? Uh, so therefore it is very important uh, to, to really uh, do a lot of research. We are going to continue with our second um, principal investigator, uh, Dr. Jose Iriarte, uh, who is uh, originally from Uruguay, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but his host institution is at the University of Exeter uh, in the United Kingdom. And he currently has a advanced grant from the European Research Council, uh, which uh, is called, or at least the abbreviation, is called the ERC Last Journey Project. So we are very much looking forward to listen to you, Jose. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, good morning to everybody, and thank you very much to the, for this invitation. What I will try to showcase uh, is uh, across Amazonia from the European Research uh, Council. It's called uh, La Journey. We, we are looking at the people of uh, South America. Here you have the, the web page. For those of you who are interested, uh, most of our publications are in, uh, are in the web page. The project is called Last Journey because we, we are looking at the at the last stop of uh, the human dispersal in the planets. Uh, in the planet, sorry. As you possibly are aware, modern humans evolved about 300 to 200,000 years before the present. About 70,000 they left Africa and started to disperse across the, all the continents, reaching Australia by 50,000 years ago, moving through Asia and reaching the Americas between 25 and 15,000 years ago. And here, researching these animals of humans to Amazonia at the very, uh, at the bottleneck of South America, that is have uh, mainly focus on the on the Colombian Amazon here. Uh, you can see uh, the map on the. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm 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 just in a small hostel here, and, and that, that the internet is not uh, is not great. W we are concentrating uh, our efforts in the Colombian Amazon, what is the government of Guaviare, lower left of. It's an unusual place for Amazonia, as you can see. It's not this low, flat landscape, but this landscape is dominated by these uh, mesa top tepuyes. And there is where we are we carrying our new place. Uh, and, and Charlotte is going to show uh, a video about our work in this region.
mean, as you can see, this is an international project between uh, Colombian, Brazilian, German, and uh, and and Danish, Danish uh, from Denmark colleagues that we are creating an interdisciplinary team in the in the region. You can see uh, some of our uh, excavations in progress where we are collecting all the materials to try to understand the, the early life ways of these first humans to arrive to Amazonia. For example, so far we have 60 radiocarbon dates that is showing that the first people to arrive to this area of Amazonia in what is today Colombia happened about 13,000 years ago. And this is very similar to the early dates that we have from uh, the lower Amazon in Brazil. And analyzing all the plant remains and animal remains and the stone tools, we know that these early people, early groups to arrive of Amazonia were hunter-gatherers that were not like the North American big game hunters, but they have a, a what we call a generalized subsistence that rely mainly on, on palms and tree fruits, small mammals, reptiles, and fish. And as you can see, they don't have the big spare head of projectile points that many of you may be aware uh, and we know as the Clovis culture in North America, but they have a very simple technology. Uh, this area is known for the for the rock art, and I think uh, our work has a lot of points uh, of connections with with Patricia. And I'm sure I'm going to get in touch in Patricia after that. There you can see the Serranía de Lindosa, where apart from the typical thing that we archaeologists study, like bones, plants, and, and stone tools, the the Serranía de la Lindosa has a, a wealth of rock art. And here we can see a view, and, and in these rock facades, you see the the canvas that these first uh, these these first groups to move into the region started to paint their stories. And I think it won't be far fetched to say that in these walls we have something like the origin of Amazonian uh, cosmovisions. Here in the picture, we can see a, a group of students from, from Antioquia, from the Max Planck in, in Germany, and, and from Exeter. Uh, we have survey, it's, uh, it's not easy, but we have surveyed all these hills. The Serranía de la Lindosa has 13 kilometers, and we have found whole new sections of rock art that were not known from Western scientists. The rock art uh, is incredible. Uh, the whole Amazonian biodiversity is painted in these walls, from harpy eagles to lizards, jaguars, uh, tapirs, and, and whatnot. Uh, many of these paintings uh, give the impression of kind of cinematographic in, impression of movement, like this monkey that you can see here leaping and doing uh, acrobatics. In other ones, we can see for example, this serpent chasing what appear to be a, a herd, possibly of quadrupeds, uh, possibly pecaris. Plants that is not uh, very well depicted in other rock arts in the world are profusely uh, depicted in Serrania, de la Lindosa, variety of human figures, like the ones you can see here. And obviously, returning to Amazonian cosmovision, something that I don't have time to get into here, we see hybrids that are part human and part animals. And talking about the special relationship that Amazonian people have uh, with animals. And there are a lot of uh, dances. The whole panels are uh, something so common in, in Amazonian societies, the whole panels depict a variety of uh, dances. Okay, just to finish this, 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 first, this first part, just to, to let you know that uh, we're working uh, for now uh, three years with the local communities. These are traditional and indigenous communities who have 
created a tourist association and they have appropriated the, the paintings. They are organized a cooperative and we have co-created this book that is called The Painted Forest that you can access here in the link below. I just come the, from the field. Last week we have been teaching uh, a diploma for these local communities with the University of Antioquia. This is uh, our work in the Colombian Amazon just to show one more time how important it is to work with the uh, local indigenous communities in Amazonia. This is in the Bolivian Amazon, a, a case study that I'm going to showcase in a second. The second, um, very briefly, the second case study that I wanted to show is uh, some of the new uh, documentation, some of the new, I don't, I don't like the word discoveries, but are revealing that uh, Amazonia was not uh, a pristine uh, forest, but was uh, teeming with people early on. And unfortunately, some of the sites are being discovered like, like this one through deforestation. This is the so-called uh, geoglyphs. These are uh, ditch geometric, perfectly geometric ditch enclosures in the state uh, of Acre that uh, unfortunately are being discovered through the deforestation. But I just wanted to show you very briefly some of the work that we have done. I'm moving a little bit south and I'm going to this forest savanna mosaic in the Llanos de Mojos, where my previous project that is called uh, ERC project that is called Pass Pre-Columbian Amazon Scale Transformations have collaborated with the uh, German Institute of Archaeology and we have carried out LIDAR in this uh, in the Llanos de uh, Mojos. This is a technology, we call it our, our lasers in the sky. This is a technology that is great because uh, these lasers, you have a, a, a LiDAR sensor that we can see here in the picture that you integrate into an aircraft. The sensor sends laser pulses. Some of them uh, go through the, the canopy and we are able to map uh, archaeological earthworks uh, in, in areas that are completely forested. And this is revolutionizing uh, archaeology and what we know about the past. And this is one of the uh, examples. This was published in, in, in Nature uh, last year. We were able to carry out LIDAR in the Llanos de Mojos. And we discovered what we have called low density urbanism. We are used to the compact, bounded, urban, early urban cities of the, of the Near East, what we are seeing in, in Amazonia is that we have urban, early urban scale societies, but they are not compact or bounded. These are uh, societies that we call them low density because they are dispersed across the landscape. And in between these major centers, we have a lot of smaller centers and a, a lot of open uh, spaces where, in this case, agriculture is practiced. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, to be a little bit uh, quick, but just to show you the, the type and the complexity of this site. Just to show, give you an idea, this is Loma Cotoca, and all the, uh, what we call, civic ceremonial architecture that you see depicted there, like the pyramids, the pyramidal mounds, the subsidiary platform mounds, is on top of a platform that is 20 hectares and five meters tall. And on top of that, you have all, all this kind of uh, architecture. So 20 hectares, we're talking about uh, 38 football fields. To give you an idea of the scale of the, um, of the monumentality of these sites. These sites, as you can see in these in this, uh, slides, are all interconnected in the, in the two figures below. You can see all the radial roads coming out of this major center that connect all this area and uh, create a, a low density urban society that is spread over uh, 4,500 uh, square kilometers. And all this landscape is completely engineered through canals and, and causeways to um, to uh, produce and, and cultivate crops, especially maize. 
I'm coming to the end, so just just before leaving, uh, I wanted to to um, to reinforce what uh, ERC projects allow us to do. This is a slide from my previous project past, where I was looking at the origins of Amazonian landscapes, and you can see when you try to answer one of these very complex questions, like the origins of Amazonian landscape, we know that Amazonia is largest of continental US. We know that have 13,000 years of history, and we know the environmental and cultural diversity that it has, as Patricia showed, ending up today in more than 300 uh, languages. You see that it's only ERC projects that allow you to uh, bring together, integrate the humanities like history with the natural sciences here, landscape characterization to look at the origins of Amazonian landscape. So there you have all the uh, archaeologists that have worked in the project, including me, the archaeobotanists, the paleocologists to reconstruct the past landscape, the botanists to see if the uh, past land use on this landscape have repercussions, have a lasting legacy on the forest today, soil science and um, remote sensing specialists to carry out the uh, life. And with that, I, I finish my presentation and I'm very happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Jose, thank you so much for sharing uh, this experience. Uh, it's, it's extremely interesting and of course, more than interesting, impactful. Um, we are going to continue with our third presentation. Uh, this time, uh, he is not yet uh, a principal investigator of an ERC, but he is a team member. Uh, I would like to remind all of you that are listening to this webinar today that uh, nationality doesn't matter. Uh, and you can apply either uh, directly to have your own ERC project, or you can also apply to be part uh, of a team of an existing uh, project led by a principal investigator. So this is going to be that case that we would like to showcase and would like to bring to you. Uh, his name is Lucas de Oliveira Pais. Uh, so as I mentioned, he's a member of uh, a team of the principal investigator uh, who is originally from the US. Uh, she has a starting grant, so we have all three scales today. Uh, but currently, uh, he's based in Norway because the host institution of this ERC project is the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs in Oslo, Norway. And he will share a little bit about the project, which is called ERC Lorex Project. So, Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure and humbling to speak after uh, these two amazing projects. And I hope to uh, make the best represent the project I, I work on uh, and also will share a bit of the work I have done. Uh, so as Victoria said, I'm not the PI of my project. PI is Dr. Alana wilson Rowe, uh, a research professor here at NUPI at the, in the Norwegian uh, University of Life Sciences in, in MBU. I am a postdoc in the project and I'm responsible for one of the work packages which focus the Amazon. So even though this is a event focused on, on the Amazon, I'll have to give you some um, a background on the project, I think, uh, before I can dive to the Amazon case and some of the findings we have. Uh, so the, the Lorex puzzle that kind of orients, uh, Elana took a bit of from this, uh, this famous uh, uh, books, uh, kids book, right? The Lorax, the Dr. Seuss the Lorax, where he says, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees, I speak for the trees, uh, because they, for the trees have, don't, have no tongues, right? So the idea is to understand uh, basically what happens when political actors claim authority to govern an ecosystem. Right? What are the broader consequences of that? Uh, and the specific angle of that is focused on regional uh, governance of ecosystems. So that, that is the governance of ecosystems that, ecosystem that goes beyond um, uh, more than one country, right? And what that that brings uh, in terms of politics amongst those countries in in uh, in, in, in other broader constellations, constellations 
of actors and the ways in which that uh, carries in, uh, important uh, commonalities and differences uh, with uh, global politics, right? When, when, when we address these ecosystems, we address the governance of nature uh, at a global scale or at a biomic scale or nationally as, you know, as part of a, a specific juridical ornament. And what Elena, kind of the, the conceptual innovation that she brings is the idea of ecosystemic politics as being this uh, broader causes and consequence of anchoring uh, international cooperation on the limited ecosystems. Uh, so the Lorax framework, right, it brings this, uh, this uh, uh, idea of ecosystem politics to three case studies, mainly, right, which corresponds each to one work packages, which is the Arctic, uh, the Caspian Sea, and the Amazon basin and rainforest, and try to analyze each of those cases through three angles. So networks of actors, who is included and excluded in this process, hierarchy, which the position of those actors in, 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 in how much they can influence this governance in processes, and norms, what are appropriate uh, uh, forms of, of behavior and what's kind of the, the, the normative infrastructure that underpins uh, interactions in those uh, governance arenas. The, the, this project has a, has a social science kind of like uh, uh, main focus. Uh, Elana, Dr. Elana is a, uh, uh, is a geographer uh, and the rest of the team has a, has a, a both a, uh, as a, oh, some of, 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 of uh, for instance, uh, Paul Beaumont and Kristen Fiesta, they both have a qualitative discourse analytical focus, whereas myself and Chris, Dr. Christiana Amalia we have a more uh, mixed methods uh, approach with emphasis in network analysis. Uh, so the fourth element of this uh, project is comparing these three cases and also comparing them within a broader uh, range of, of cases where uh, international cooperation is built, built around well-defined uh, ecosystem, ecosystems. So uh, here's a bit of the team. Again, we can, uh, so just to, we can just say that's a broader effort. So I'll go quickly through some of the findings we have. From the team and then i'll talk about the amazon case uh, uh, so uh, here we have one first publication in political geography where elana discussed the analytical framework they just uh, com uh, commented on and then analyze a bit the arctic case where she uh, demonstrates how uh, within the evolution of the arctic council uh, which is the is the, is the governance arrangement of the of the arctic actors start uh, uh, delineating uh, a boundary separating those that are that can claim to be with part of the Arctic, both state and non-state actors, indigenous uh, actors as well, and those that are outside. And so then the way that they kind of claim the centrality of this space, and we can go into details, but I don't have the time. It's a very fascinating publication. Then Elena and Paul, uh, they focus on the, on, the, on another paper on the Caspian Sea, where it's quite interesting where they see also this construction of hierarchy. Uh, um, through the governance of the Caspian Sea, in the sense that you have emerging, uh, it, it have external actors uh, uh, helping those states, and majorly the the UN United Nations Environmental Program, the UNAP, but not only uh, that try to start, you know, having uh, some framework to work to, to co-manage co this 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 sea that goes across five states. Uh, and it's it's very interesting the ways in which the actors try to delimit who is able to participate in these arenas in a way that kind of like put this uh, uh, external actors more and more to the outside. Uh, and then finally, the, this we have this comparative uh, uh, work by uh, Dr. Elana Wilson Rowe and Dr. Christiana Malia, where they they present a broader database situating these findings across several ecosystems. And hence, and, and, and there you, you have some more interesting variation in terms of, uh, in terms of either whether uh, this ecosystems focus specifically on, um, and you have like a specific organization for the ecosystem where it's part of a broader regime. And you, you can, as you can see in these maps, you have, uh, it's, it's very uneven how this, uh, this uh, governance is distributed across different uh, parts of the globe. Uh, here on the top, on the top right, you have uh, terrestrial ecosystems, and on the uh, bottom left, of the bottom right, you have the maritime ecosystems. So, uh, I can go through on the Q and A. Uh, 
Uh, so now coming to the Amazon, that's my part. I'll, I'll have, have some some half of the time to to discuss that. Uh, we have a very interesting case of that in, in in the sense that you cannot understand Amazon governance uh, only based on uh, the, the the states that that that, that govern it, right? You, you have first of all uh, uh, a diversity of actors who inhabit the Amazon, right, and uh, the, whose interests often conflict with those states. And you have, as this, this map uh, shows, the Amazon provides several services to the globe that are that cannot be uh, limited to the to the region itself, especially in terms of of, uh, of climate mitigation, but not only, right? In terms of its biodiversity, in terms of uh, several other types of ecosystemic services. So, uh, and kind of like as a Brazilian, I always noted this. Amazon, uh, uh, the, the governance of the Amazon has been something that's kind of like it's it has an international dimension, right? Which probably was most famous uh, in uh, the crisis of 2019 after the after the when you have like this massive fires and you have international reaction uh, and re the, all the rebukes between the then president Jair Bolsonaro and, and, and French president Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and I think what's kind of like was not seen at the same time in Leticia was happening a meeting with all chiefs of chiefs of states or representative of them uh, from Evo Morales to Bolsonaro, where they kind of like manifested a joint uh, position in terms of their sovereignty over the Amazon. And I think that's kind of an interesting dynamic that it kind of picked upon uh, that that I that what happened when I was starting my postdoc and picked upon uh, the, the the rest of the research was this dynamic between having trying to uh, to address the global functions of the Amazon and this position of states is kind of like very defensive in terms of their sovereignty. Uh, so that resulted in two publications. Uh, the first one I tried to understand uh, the emergency. Uh, uh, the, the, the emergence, uh, not the emergency, even though there's a lot of emergency <laughs> uh, aspects to it, the emergence of the Amazon as a region in world politics. So in, in, in the, the ways in which the, 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 the Amazon is represented as a region in uh, global environmental governance. And, and there we can see that the ways in which uh, the Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization helped the, 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 the Amazon states to organize uh, a coalition uh, to uh, to collaborate uh, in all positions, uh, in, in most of the positions that affect the Amazon. Here, analyze uh, then uh, interactions in environmental negotiations in, 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 in several regimes, and we can see as this the figure to the to the right tries to show uh, how the the Brazil and other Amazon Amazon countries and uh, the ACTO, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, is the international organization that comprehends the, the eight Amazon states. Uh, they work as kind of like a, a, a block in those negotiations, mediating between other actors that are uh, uh, that are, that have interests in uh, in protecting the Amazon, in, in influencing the regimes that impact the Amazon, and also local actors. Kind of they, they make work this bridge for such as uh, indigenous organizations. Uh, then a second uh, 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 paper that, that I worked, I tried to understand a bit this global and uh, regional interplay uh, uh, through two, two, basically two mechanisms, right? One is defensive sovereignty, in which way states try to preserve uh, the, the, the governance of this ecosystem under, under, under their sovereignty as a preserve of their, of their jurisdictions. But at the same time, uh, you know, we have pressure, both bottom up uh, and, and top down pressures uh, to uh, for those states to assume some responsibilities, right? That, that come not only for them, but, but also from external actors. Uh, and so the, the kind of the, the idea of bargain stewardship uh, came uh, as a way to describe this movement. And we can see that uh, or working through the Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization through dynamics of external funding through time. Here you have uh, just so a broad overview of uh, funding from the 1980s, 2020, where you have uh, the the thickness of each bar is kind of the amount of funding you have uh, from external actors, and that was an interesting process in which you turn this defensive so the defense of sovereignty into actually a middle ground where states try to start finding uh, ways to harmonize their policies and work with external actors to improve their governance of the Amazon. Uh, even though we have a, a, a reversal of that uh, during the Bolsonaro area, area in where the defense of sovereignty comes back, uh, I think this dynamic of kind of like 
achieving improved bargaining stewardship is, is very relevant for how to think, uh, for instance, in this moment where now we're, we have a more positive environment towards the government of the Amazon, how it can best collaborate between local actors, states, and international actors. So I, I am already over time, but I can go back to discussion and implications in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas, and all three of you. I think we were very ambitious as the ERC projects to try to fit three amazing projects into one hour. But uh, well, we try to also optimize the, the time uh, of, of all of us and also of our listeners. I would like to just ask one question to all of you um, before we wrap up the webinar. Um, I would like to ask about your local collaborators. Do you collaborate with local universities, research institutions, or even uh, the private sector? Or are you involving any NGOs um, or even small, medium-sized enterprises to help you uh, to achieve the goals of the project? No, in, in, in the current project, I, apart from the Max Planck <clears throat> University of Copenhagen, we are uh, collaborating with uh, Universidad de Antioquia in Medellín and the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And here at the regional level, we are uh, working and collaborating with the Secretariat of Culture and Tourism of the Department of Guaviare. And we are uh, working with the uh, local, traditional, uh, and indigenous communities here in the in the Colombian in Amazon. Yeah, so uh, we've tried in Echo to collaborate with different institutions, not just uh, as a matter of of synergy and of of putting together resources, but also as a matter of sharing uh, research that is done funded uh, by by the ERC with the people in South America who are the ones that are really perhaps more impacted by this kind of research. And so uh, just as an example, this summer, we had an event in the Catholic University of, of Lima, uh, exactly with the idea of, of sharing some of the research with researchers that are located in South America. Um, well, beyond that, we collaborate also in Brazil with the Center for Amerindian Studies, uh, we've collaborated with the Video in the Villages um, um, platform in Brazil that, that is dedicated to indigenous cinema. But more importantly, we are trying to collaborate also with indigenous communities, I think a bit, uh, uh, a bit like uh, Jose. Uh, and so this, this video I mentioned that was a collaboration between our team uh, a Shipibo uh, community and, and the Brazilian artist is an example of that collaboration with uh, local, local indigenous uh, peoples because the goal is that uh, the research uh, is, uh, is based on a dialogue and not just us going there and, and, and researching uh, the people who are somewhere else. So we wanted to create uh, an exchange more than uh, more than this occupying this position of the one who goes and, and researches the Amazon because this has been done a lot and often with with negative consequences for Amazonian people so at least we are trying to um, uh, reconsider that mode of doing research and working more with the people and not so much on the people uh, so that's that's my short answer to that thank you thank you so much uh, Lucas would you like to add also uh, something yeah, so our our project has no uh, institutional partners. It's own, uh, but uh, as part of the empirical, you know, the, the, the research itself, we have we developed uh, many collaborations uh, with individual individual researchers in so in all the areas we, we we research, of course, and in the case of the Amazon, uh, we have you know in, in informal collaborations uh, with researchers of the FGV São Paulo, uh, some the member in the Igarapé Institute. Um, and, and also uh, the uh, the Amazon organization, uh, cooperation organization, cooperation treaty organization, the, the ACTO or the OTCA, uh, has been also very welcoming, and we try to to also have a collaborative uh, relation with them. They allow for field work, uh, and also uh, we have had also a series of of, uh, of uh, interviews and discussions with uh, indigenous organizations of the Amazon. You know where the uh, the Koyab was uh, the, the, the was very 
uh, also very collaborative. And so we, we, we had those informal ties uh, that were part of the, of the research process, but we don't have any partnerships uh, for, formally as part of the project in, in none, of, none of the three cases. Thank you so much. Before we close, uh, I would like to show you uh, the current ERC uh, grant uh, call calendar uh, for 2024 in case uh, all these amazing researchers have inspired you to think about your own ERC project or be part of uh, a team of an already existing uh, principal investigator, which oftentimes you can find on the Your Access portal under the Jobs and Funding tab. We do have a lot of jobs and funding opportunities on our website, and uh, among them, you can also find um, a few opportunities to be part uh, of uh, a team of a uh, PI of a European Research Council grant. If you are not yet ready, uh, to have your uh, own project. But if you are, so these are uh, this is the calendar for 2024. Most of the calls are actually open. Uh, the starting grant, the consolidator grant opened last week. The synergy grant is open and the advanced grant will open next year. The, the opening dates are more or less the same every year. These are calls that open annually. Therefore, if you are not ready yet uh, to apply for your own ERC grant, uh, I think that it's better to wait a little bit longer to really have a solid proposal, an excellent one, um, so you can be our next uh, ERC grantee. I would also like to mention uh, a wonderful uh, webinar that will be organized directly by our colleagues from the European Research Council tomorrow on the 20th of September, which, will, which is called the ERC Grant Competitions 2024, uh, where they will discuss um, during this webinar, it will be interactive, uh, where potential applicants uh, will learn more about the novelties of the ERC Work Program 2024 uh, by the uh, ERC um, uh, managers, Angela Liberatore and Jose La Bastida, uh, and participants will have the opportunity to also ask questions about the current and upcoming grant competitions. Of course, the timing is not the best for uh, Latin America because it will happen uh, at 12 at, at noon uh, European time, uh, but the good thing is that it will stay recorded uh, on the website that you can see uh, on, the, um, on the slide. So don't worry, you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night. With that, I would like to, again, uh, on behalf of uh, the EURAXIS Latin American Caribbean team, Charlotte and myself, we would like to thank our speakers, uh, Patricia, Jose, Lucas, Thank you so much uh, for sharing your projects, for sharing the inspired, uh, inspiring stories um, and the wonderful research uh, that you are doing uh, that has um, a worldwide really impact uh, on the society. Here you can see um, our uh, social media where you can reach us as your access, uh, our website, uh, our, our email address as well. As you know, uh, we are here in Latin America to help you find um, the, the fellowships, uh, financing and opportunities uh, for your research projects, either for mobility grants or for collaborative projects with European partners. So you can always count on our support when it comes to information, assistance, and these type of uh, webinars and information sessions that we bring to the whole research community in Latin America and the Caribbean. And on the, uh, the QI, uh, QR code or on the link that you can see on the website, you can sign up uh, to receive our flash notes that we send twice a month, where we, of course, inform uh, about the latest calls, uh, news and events that we prepare for you. So thank you again to our speakers. Uh, thank you to uh, our participants of the webinar. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.